Let's worship Jesus here tonight where and wherever you guys are at out there in the internet land. We're here to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Lord God, we, we come to you with open hearts, ready to celebrate who you are, ready to hear your truth, to experience your goodness. We love you, Lord. I was hopeless. I knew I was lost. Death and darkness were my only sorrows. I needed someone to come and rescue me. And mercy heard my plea. Because, Lord, you found me. You healed me. You called me from the grave. You gave me a real love. Thank you, Jesus. You washed my sins away. Now I'm living, forgiven. You came and set me free. That's what your mercy did for me. You gave me beauty for my guilty state. Day to day by his grace. So excuse me if I can't contain my praise. Cause I know that I've been saved. Cause Lord, you found me, you healed me, you called me from a grave, you gave me a real love. Thank you, Jesus. You washed my sins away. Now I'm living, forgiven, you came and set me free. That's what your mercy did for me. Here we go. Every morning, mercy will restore me. I will proclaim. Call me from the grave, give me a real low. Thank you, Jesus. You wash my sins away. Now I'm living, forgive him. You came and set me free. That's what your mercy did for me. Jesus, lover of my soul, Jesus, I will never let you go. You're taking me from the miry clay. You set my feet upon the rock, and now I know who I love you. My world may fall, I'll never let you go. My Savior, my closest friend, I will worship you until the very end. Jesus, you the lover of my soul. Jesus, I will never let you go. 
taken me from the mighty clear. You set my feet upon the rock. Now I know I love you. I need you. Though my world may fall, I'll never let you go. closest friend I will worship you until the very end Taking me from the miry clear, you set my feet upon the rock. Now I know I love you. I need you. Though my world may fall, I'll never let you go. My Savior, my closest friend, I will worship you until the very end. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. You're worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart. Lead me in your love to those around me. God, we pray that you would grow our eyes of faith. That as we step out of this building tonight and every week, Lord God, that we would over and over again just encounter people hungry and thirsty for your love. And God, that you would give us the words, that you would give us the prayers, that you would give us the challenges of faith, that we could step up that we could be obedient, that we could be your salt and be your light and be your hands and be your feet and be your mouthpiece to this community, God, to this beautiful big island, Lord Jesus, that we could worship you in spirit and in truth, that we could worship you on our Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, Sunday, and yes, every day of the week, Lord God, that we could honor you, that we could glorify you, and that others would be drawn to you drawn to the fragrance of your goodness. In your name we pray. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore Every heart that is broken, great are you, Lord. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out your praise, pour out your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only great are you Lord and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry Bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great. So we pour out our praise, 
We pour out our praise at your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise at your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. We worship you here tonight, Lord Jesus. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your presence. That you didn't stay far away. That you cared enough to come to be here with us. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Joel, for that. That was wonderful. Thank you, everybody who's online watching with us tonight as well. Been chatting with you guys. If you haven't hit that share button yet, please do me a favor and click that button. Help us extend our reach. We really appreciate your help in that. Aloha to our local folks who are here in the house with us. Glad you guys are here. We're so thankful for you and your faithful attendance every single Wednesday night. We're so pleased that you're here with us. Don't forget there's three ways to support the church financially. Number one, you can use the Yay God boxes. Number two, you can use the online giving address you see on the screen. Number three, you can use the P.O. box and send the check to that address. All three great ways to support the ministry God's called us to do. We're excited about what God's calling us to continue doing in this unusual and unprecedented time of ministry. We have great hope for where God's leading us in the future, and your generosity helps make that happen. So mahalo every single penny helps. Well, if you were with us last night, either in in person or online, you know that we began a new series, and we're calling it GPS, God's Positioning System, and we talked about two guardrails. We said there's two great guardrails that God has put in our life to help us determine what his personal will is for our life. We said one of these we call the providential will of God. And we can read about that in Scripture. And providential will of God is this. There's just some things God's going to do. God's going to do just because he's God and he wants to do it. And it doesn't matter if we want him to do it. It doesn't matter if we believe he's going to do it. God's going to do it. Anyway, it's his providential will. We said, for example, the coming of the Messiah is one of those things. Didn't matter whether anybody wanted the Messiah to come. Didn't matter whether anybody asked for it. Didn't matter whether anybody believed it was going to happen. God was going to do it anyway. God was going to send the Messiah. The providential will of God is one of God's GPS guardrails to help us find our personal will in his personal will for our life. And then we said the second guardrail is the moral will of God. And we said these are all the do's and don'ts that God's already revealed to us in his written word in the Bible. God's already said, hey, this thing, it's a sin. It's wrong. Don't do that. That's something you shouldn't be engaging in. And then there are other things. God said, hey, you know what? These things are really good things. You should be doing these things. These are positive things. That's the moral will of God, the moral guardrail. And we said that whatever the personal will of God is for your life on any given day of your life, it will 100% fall somewhere between these two broad guardrails. If something you're trying to do in your life comes into conflict, either with God's providential will or God's moral will, you are going to crash. It's not going to turn out well for you. There's no possible way it could be God's personal will for your life if you're crashing into either one of these guardrails. So we can imagine some questions that we might think of. Should I rob a bank? Should I have an extramarital affair? You don't have to spend hours agonizing about those kinds of questions. You don't have to pray about those decisions. God's already answered those kinds of questions for us. So we need to be smart enough to not crash into the guardrails that God has already established. But we know, well, gosh, there's still a lot of space between those two guardrails, isn't there? There's an infinite number of potential paths we can take through life, infinite number of decisions we have to make, opportunities we can embrace or not embrace, that none of those violate the providential or the moral will of God. But here's the thing, not every single one of those paths is going to be beneficial for you. Not every single one of those paths will lead you to your best 
possible life. And that's what we really want, right? We want the best possible life that God's guiding us towards. This is his personal will for your life. And so last week, I promised I would share a shortcut with you for the times that we have these sort of super pressing instant decisions that we have to make, right? And we go, gosh, how can I know God's will right now? You know, what if I haven't been a Christian long enough to really fully understand the moral will of God? What if I really haven't been a Christian long enough to fully understand the providential will of God? Or what if I feel like I got a pretty good handle on those things, but I still have to make some decision right now? And it won't necessarily wreck my whole life, but it won't lead to the best possible decision I can make in life. It's not ideal, right? And so normally we want to have time to pray about it, to research it, to read the Bible, to try to come up with the best possible answer to find God's personal will in our situations in life. But sometimes we just don't have that kind of time, right? And in our GPS theme of this series, this is a question we're really asking. We're saying, hey, isn't there a shortcut? Can't somebody just tell me the answer? Can't somebody who's been there already tell me how to get there? Can't somebody just give me some GPS coordinates? Can't I just plug into Google Maps and get a step-by-step set of directions from how to get from here to there? Do I really have to figure this decision out on my own? Can't somebody just say, hey, you know what? Somebody else had the exact same problem, and they went that away. That's the title of tonight's message. They went that away. And that's the shortcut we want to use in those urgent decision times, right? Tell you a true story. Years ago, down in North Carolina, there was a group of us. We were coming back from a Promise Keepers event. Great big stadium thing, 27,000 men, just praising God, having this great weekend together. And at the end of the event came about, and we decided well, it was time to go back to the hotel. Now, this was before we all had Google Maps on our iPhones, right? And so some people maybe had Garmin GPS devices in their car, but most people didn't. We certainly didn't. And so what happened was we got turned around in downtown Raleigh, and we didn't know the area very well, and plus there was a whole bunch of construction going on, a lot of one-way streets, bridges out, all kinds of things. And before long, we were really turned around. Very cloudy night, couldn't even look for the North Star, right? We were lost. And like most men, we weren't about to stop and ask for directions. Are you kidding me? We were sure we could figure out how to get there on our own. And so for, I think it was a couple hours in downtown Raleigh, we just got turned around again and again and again and again looking for something that looked familiar driving down one-way streets, getting stopped at dead ends, turning back around, backing up. I mean, with all this construction and stuff, we were hopelessly lost. So finally, we gave up. We pulled into a gas station to ask directions, and the guy who was working the counter had evidently been dipping into the six-packs that night in the back storage room. He was about three sheets to the wind when we showed up, and we told him the name of our hotel, and we asked him for directions, and the guy said, well, let me think for a minute, and he thought. He scratched his head some more, and he thought some more, and he thought some more, and he said, hmm, you know what? Y'all can't get there from here. Y'all can't get there from here. I mean, we thought, wow, we're more lost than we thought we were. We have hit the end of the earth or something, right? You can't get there from here at all. We're stuck forever in this gas station with this guy. So we were like, okay, we need to leave. So we left, and we drove a little bit further, and then eventually we found another gas station. And in this one, there were three guys standing around, talking, shooting the breeze. We told them the name of the hotel. We asked, hey, can you guys give us directions? So the first guy said, well, yeah, let's see. Uh, You go about two blocks this way, and then you turn there. And another guy said, oh, no, 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 they can't go that way. Remember the road's closed. Remember the construction? First guy says, oh, yeah, that's right. Hmm. So then the second guy goes, oh, oh, I know what you could do. You could cut three blocks over this way and turn left there and go across the bridge. Guy number three interrupted. No, y'all, that bridge is out, remember? Oh, yeah, yeah. And so this went back and forth for several minutes. And finally, I kid you not, all three of these guys simultaneously said, you know what? Y'all can't get there from here. Y'all can't get there from here. That's where we really started to panic because we thought, oh, my gosh, maybe we really can't get there from here. Maybe we went through a wormhole and we're in an alternate universe or something. I mean, what's going on? We're stuck in this place forever. So we get back on the road again. We eventually try a third station. And this time the guy happened to live near the hotel we were trying to get to, and he said, hey, you know what? I'm just getting off work. If you can wait a few minutes, you can follow me, and I'll take you right to it. 
I'll tell you what, we kept our eyes glued to his taillights the whole way back. And we frequently said, he went that away, he went that away, he went that away. And we were able to get safely back to the hotel. So here's the reason I share that story with you. Tonight, we are going to look at a vitally important principle that God gives us that is just so obvious, there's a tendency for us to overlook it. And the principle is this. God wants us to know his will even more than we want to know it. God wants us to know his will even more than we want to know his will. He wants you to know which way to go. That's the principle. God wants you to know his will even more than you want to know his will. That's so obvious, and it's so important, and yet there's a tendency for us to completely overlook that. Now, we're going to read a story from 1 Kings 12 tonight about a king that stumbled onto this principle, but then he violated it. He missed it. So let me start by giving you some background, a little bit of context, because C-I-E, context is everything. And so Solomon was the third king of Israel after Saul and then after his father, David. And in many ways, Solomon was a great king. And God actually gave Solomon this incredible option, an option God doesn't give to everyone, but he gave this option to Solomon. He could ask for anything he wanted, and God would give it to him. And so Solomon, instead of choosing wealth or power, he asked for wisdom to lead the people of Israel well. And God granted Solomon both the wisdom he asked for, but he also granted Solomon vast wealth and political power. So Solomon had all of this wisdom. But the problem was, because of pride and rebellion, he didn't always follow the wisdom that he was imparting to others. And his biggest mistake came when he married many women who were from foreign countries, right? It's kind of political marriages. He worshipped foreign, these women worshipped foreign gods, false gods, and God had told Solomon not to do this because they would eventually turn his heart away from God, Yahweh, and turn his heart toward these false gods. But Solomon ignored this wisdom out of pride and rebellion. He did not obey God. He went ahead and married these women. And then in his old age, the exact thing God said was going to happen happened. He began to turn his heart towards these foreign gods of his wives and away from God. He started to build idols for them. He started to make sacrifices to them. And obviously, all of this broke God's heart. And so God basically said to Solomon, listen, Solomon, you have disappointed me greatly. And as a result of this, after you die, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to tear the majority of your kingdom away from your son, Rehoboam, okay? Out of respect to your father, David, who, despite a lot of his own problems, at his core, he was a man after my own heart. And so out of respect for David, I'm going to leave a fragment of the original kingdom of Israel in place. Rehoboam's kingdom will now become the kingdom of Judah, but the rest of the tribes of Israel, I'm going to tear away and have somebody else be the king of these tribes, and their nation will keep the name Israel. And then God also began to raise up adversaries against Solomon including remnants of foreign powers that David had previously vanquished, and they sort of came and got revenge, right? And then one day God sent Ahijah, the prophet of Shiloh, to meet a man named Jeroboam. A little bit confusing sometimes. We've got Rehoboam and Jeroboam, okay? Rehoboam is Solomon's son. Jeroboam is a very high-up official in Solomon's kingdom. And through Ahijah, God spoke a prophecy to Jeroboam. And God said, listen, Solomon has disappointed me greatly. And so because of his sin, I'm going to tear most of his kingdom away from his son, And Jeroboam, you are going to get to rule over the ten tribes of Israel, and Solomon's son, Rehoboam, will only rule over one. Now, when Solomon learned of this, when he learned that Jeroboam was going to be the guy who would help accomplish this prophecy of God, Solomon, still in rebellion, tried to kill him. But Jeroboam escaped to Egypt. Now, eventually, Solomon died. And before the people of Israel would give their full support of crowning his son Rehoboam as their new king, they said, we want to make one simple request of you. And that's where we pick up in 1 Kings chapter 12 tonight. The whole assembly of Israel goes to Rehoboam and they say to him, your father put a heavy yoke on us. 
But now, lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke he put on us, and we will serve you. Now, this is really a defining moment for this young king, Rehoboam. He's got a really big, really tough decision to make. There was a lot at stake here for Rehoboam, because to agree to lighten up might signal weakness to the people. And suddenly he may, might find himself kind of being held hostage to the whims of the people that he's trying to lead. If that happens, then he never actually gets to be the leader of the country because he's always just doing whatever the people make him do. He's already shown weakness. They know they can take advantage of him. And still, he knew that they had a good point. His dad had been kind of a pain, had been kind of tough on the people, and he probably should lighten their load a little bit. That might make them more willing to follow him and might make them more willing to trust him as their king and their leader. So he had this really tough decision. And he was a young man. He didn't have a lot of skill. He didn't have a lot of experience. He didn't have a lot of wisdom in this area. And so he really doesn't know what's the right decision. I don't, I don't know. And yet it's an urgent decision. He has to do something. <coughs> so the first thing he does is actually a really smart thing. And this is a lesson for us to learn, too, when you or I have to make a really tough decision in a short amount of time. <coughs> if possible, we want to ask for more time. We want to ask for more time to think through this before we make a rash decision that we can't take back later. We're going to take as much time as we possibly can before we make a really huge, important decision. And so that's what Rehoboam does. He does the right thing at first. Look at verse 5. Rehoboam answered, go away for three days and then come back to me. So the people went away. And next, Rehoboam does another really smart thing. He did what all of us need to do whenever we've got a high-pressure deadline decision we're trying to make. He tried to get insight and input from older wiser men with more experience and more wisdom in this particular area of leadership. And then look at verses 6 and 7. Then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who had served his father Solomon during his lifetime. How would you advise me to answer these people, he asked. And they replied, if today you will be a servant to these people and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants. That was good advice. That was the wise advice. And if Rehoboam had taken their advice, mm, things might have turned out differently in this story. God might have seen Rehoboam repenting, making better decisions than his father. God may have changed his providential will. He may have held off on his decision to tear apart the kingdom. Moses and Abraham had both been successful at influencing God to rethink what he wanted to do with his providential will. And so who knows, maybe if Rehoboam had made a different decision, he might have succeeded too. However, Rehoboam didn't. He departed from this good judgment that he received, and he rejected the advice of the wise older leaders, and instead he decided to consult with the young men serving with him who had grown up with him. And there was a lot at stake for these guys. They were in the king's good graces because they were his childhood buddies. They had known him their whole life. And they loved the idea of soaking up the pleasures and privileges of being pals with the king. They were young, they were immature, they had hot heads, and they had little patience. And so when Rehoboam asked their advice, they advised him to react with anger and threats. Listen to what they say in verses 10 and 11. The young men who had grown up with him replied, These people have said to you, Your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make our yoke lighter. Ugh. Now you tell them, my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. My father laid on you the heavy yoke. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. Right? Can you imagine? It's like these good old boys were just sitting around the campfire throwing back some cone along boards, you know, and they're like, Psh, you know what I do? They talk to me like that. I smack them down and give them cracks for sure. Right? So they listen to this horrible advice. They get Rehoboam all fired up. He listens to his hot-headed buddies, and he did what they told him to do. He did this very foolish thing. Three days later, Jeroboam and all the people return to Rehoboam. And so now the guy that's going to tear the kingdom away from him is with the rest of the people. As the king had said, he says, come back to me in three days. And so they did. And the king answered the people harshly. Rehoboam says, 
rejecting the advice given to him by the elders, he followed the advice of the young men, and he said this, My father made your yoke heavy. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. Ha <laughs> ha, take that, right? And now listen to verse 15. This is important. So the king did not listen to the people, for this turn of events was from the Lord to fulfill the word the Lord had spoken to Jeroboam, son of Nebat, through Ahijah the Shilonite. Shilonite, excuse me. God's providential will to tear apart the kingdom is an act of judgment, and it comes to pass because Rehoboam didn't do what he was supposed to do. Solomon didn't do what he was supposed to do. But again, we saw both Moses and Abraham able to impact God's providential will, influence his course of judgment. And perhaps if Rehoboam had chosen the path of wisdom instead of listening to the young hothead's advice, maybe things could have been different. Maybe this judgment could have been averted. Maybe God would have shown grace and mercy because of the repentant heart of Rehoboam, but he didn't. And so we know there's value in going to other older, wiser people for advice. So remember the principle we started with tonight. God wants us to know his will even more than we want to know his will. Rehoboam rejected wise counsel. He accepted foolish counsel. So what's the lesson for you and me? God wants us to use the counsel of older, wiser Christians. Sometimes our closest friends, they aren't the best people to gain advice from. Sometimes they're just too close to us. They're too close to our emotions. They're too close to our age. They're too close to our personal life to really be objective. And so we find ourselves in this position. I've got this urgent, time-sensitive decision. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? How am I going to figure out this thing? How am I going to make a decision, right? How am I going to ever get to the right destination? And God says, hey, listen, I've given you a GPS, God's positioning system. I've given you older, wiser Christians who have already had to make decisions very similar to, sometimes the exact same decision that you're trying to make now. And they went that way, right? Follow them. You don't have to make every single decision of your life independently. If you want to know which way to go, then look for decisions and directions from other wise believers and follow them. It worked out good for them. It'll work out good for you. But you've got to learn to ask the right people. And that's one of the big mistakes that we make. Sometimes we ask direction and wisdom from some people who are, let's be kind, a little squirrely, right? And if you realize that God can speak to you through the advice and the wisdom of people that God has placed around you, and you can choose who to listen to carefully, don't miss this, you're going to be amazed at how quickly you can learn the personal will of God for your life in specific situations that just moments before seemed completely impossible for you to grasp, completely beyond your ability and capacity to understand. (coughs) So it's one thing to learn wisdom. It's another thing to consistently apply that wisdom in your own decisions. And again, Solomon, the guy that initially created this problem situation for his son Rehoboam, was the wisest man to ever live. He's the one who constantly writes about the value and the need for wisdom. He constantly encourages us to always bring in the advice of older and wiser people. And still, sometimes even Solomon didn't always take his own advice. And his son paid a huge price for that foolishness. Now, I am certainly not the wisest man who ever lived, not by a long shot. And Solomon, with all of his faults, was still way more wise than I am. So I'm going to listen to Solomon, right? If Solomon says I should ask for advice from other people, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask for advice from other people as I struggle with decisions in my life. And I think we would all be wise to do that. Proverbs 1.5 says, let the wise listen and add to their learning and let the discerning get guidance. Proverbs 15.22 says, plans fail for lack of counsel but with many advisors, they succeed. Proverbs 19.20 says, Listen to advice and accept discipline, and at the end, you will be counted among the wise. So again, here's Solomon, wisest man in the world, and he's written all of these passages, as well as many others that say, look, if you want to make the right decisions, you've got to invite other people in on the decision. And a lot of this wisdom, I think, he gained by the mistakes 
that he himself made along the way. As they say, experience is the best teacher, right? And so Solomon made the mistake of not listening to his own God-given wisdom. Now, As a pastor, I get to help people deal with all kinds of decisions, marriage decisions, financial decisions, relationship decisions, career decisions, faith decisions. People come to me, and they ask me to pray with them, and they ask for my advice, and they ask for my wisdom, and I do my best to impart biblical wisdom to them in all of those situations. I do my best to impart my personal wisdom from my own life experience to them. And most often, though, here's what happens. People come to me after they've already made a really bad decision, or three, or 12 bad decisions in a row, and now they're in deep, right? And so one of the first questions I'll ask them is, well, did you talk to anybody about this before you made that decision? Did you ask for anybody's advice before you did that? And almost 100% of the time, the answer I hear is, no, I just decided myself. And I say, well, that's why you're in this mess. God doesn't expect you to be a super genius. God doesn't expect you to know everything. God doesn't expect you to understand all things. You have to find somebody who has a little bit of objectivity, often someone who's a little older, someone a little more experienced than you, who can say, like people have said to me many times in my life, hmm, Greg, boy, that sounds like a really bad idea to me. You you might not want to do that. Sometimes people come to see me while they're still trying to make a tough decision. And with a little bit of objectivity and an average IQ and a lot of life experience and sometimes with a little bit better understanding of the providential or the moral will of God shown in the word of God to me, I can say to them, okay, I hear what you're going through. I hear the decision you're making. So listen, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. Here's how things are going to work out. On the other hand, if you make this choice, here's what's going to happen. And things are going to go really sour in your life. So I don't think I would do that if I were you. I think I would do this if I were you. Now, sometimes people take my advice in those areas. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they'll come back weeks or months or even years later after their life has spun completely out of control. Everything's gone wrong. And they come up to me and they'll say something like this. Pastor Greg, how did you know? How did you know? Everything turned out exactly the way you said it was going to turn out. I made that decision, even though you said it was a bad idea, and everything turned out exactly the way you said it would. My life went right down the toilet. Everything's awful. How did you know? And I always say, because I'm from the future. No, it's because God's wisdom is so clear, right? When I ask Christians if they have asked the advice of anybody anybody who might already know the way they should go. They often say, no, no, I didn't ask anybody's advice. I prayed about it, though. I prayed about it. I prayed about it a lot. And now listen, prayer is a wonderful thing. And God absolutely wants us to seek his will through prayer. But listen, God has also given each of us each other to help seek his will and to learn how to make these kinds of decisions. And the wise advice of others, this is what Proverbs tells us over and over again, the wise advice of others is one of those primary tools that God is going to use to reveal his personal will for us. So when we don't do that, and then we go make this major bad decision, what do we want to do? We want to turn to God and get mad at God. God, why didn't you stop me? You saw I was making this dumb decision. I prayed about it. How come you didn't stop me? And God says, you know, I tried to stop you. I sent this person and I sent that person to advise you, to redirect you. I had all these people around you giving you the wise advice that you needed. You didn't seek any of them out. You didn't listen to any of them. See, we always want God's voice to appear as kind of a big thunderbolt of lightning in the sky and speak to us the way he did Moses on Mount Sinai. But here's the thing. God doesn't typically work that way. That's, that's a really rare thing when God speaks to people that way. Most of the time, the vast majority of the time, God speaks through the wisdom of other people who have already walked further on the journey than you have. People who can see, oh, yeah, you should go that away. Right? One of the primary tools of God's positional system for guiding us to his personal will for each of our lives, in between his providential will and his moral will, is through the wisdom and through the guidance and direction of other Christian people. 
And so when we're sitting around going, oh, which way do I go? Which way do I go? God says to us through other wise Christian people, hey, hey, listen, you go that away. You go that away. Now, maybe you've had this experience. You're struggling with a really big decision. And so you're laying out all the details to a friend or a family member or a pastor or a counselor and a, or a teacher or a coach, somebody. And then that person says just like one or two very simple, basic things that for whatever reason you, you just hadn't thought of. And it's like, boom, the light goes on and you go, oh, my gosh, of course, of course. Why didn't I think of that? That's what I need to do. You instantly know how to do it, where to go to do it. You feel peace about the decision. It's not that that person was smarter than you are. It's not that they're holier than you are. It's just that they've been down the road before. They've experienced a similar situation, and they either made the right choice or the wrong choice when it was their turn. And so now they're able to give you a couple of things to think about. And there's your answer. Or maybe you've had an experience like this. You hear somebody preaching or somebody sharing a devotional, or even just a story from their life, and you go, oh my gosh, it's like God is speaking directly to me through that person right now. And I hear that often after messages. Somebody will come up to me after service and say, Greg, that was for me. That was for me. God spoke directly to me through what you were saying. It was like you had been following me around all week. And I say, I wasn't, I, f I promise. I wasn't. You knew exactly what was going on in my life. You said exactly what I needed to hear. Greg, how did you do that? And I always say, because I'm from the future. No, it's because God is just using me as he uses each of us to help show his will to those who are seeking his will. He uses you to help show his will for me at times, too. We look out for each other. We're in this together. That's what the body of Christ does. That's what the family of God does. And so the person who gave you wise advice is doing what God created them to do. And when you give wise advice to someone else, you're doing what God created you to do. God uses wise people that he's put around you to speak wisdom to you about his will. And the truth is, that's where a lot of God's personal will for your life is going to come to you. It's going to come from wise people, Christian people, who have already been down the journey a little further than you have. Well, we went that way. Maybe you should too. And so develop a sensitivity to this fact and realize that this is a tool that God uses and begin to listen strategically. Now, you might say, well, listen, Greg. Can't I get bad advice? Can't I possibly still get bad advice from a pastor or a counselor or an older friend? Of course. Of course. The issue is we need to establish boundaries and parameters about how to listen to, how to look for, find, and listen to the right people, how to recognize the right kind of advice. So as we close tonight, I want to finish by giving you five strategies, five strategies to help you listen to the right people, and how to find the right kind of advice. So the first one is, choose people who have nothing to lose by telling you the truth. Choose people who have nothing to lose by telling you the truth. That was a problem with Rehoboam's plan. He asked his friends, <laughs> who all had a lot to lose, based on which decision he would make. And like Rehoboam, you might have some friends who honestly are more concerned about the friendship than they are about you making the right decision for your life. Or you might have some false friends who are more concerned about their own piece of the pie than they are about what's best for you. Choose people who have nothing to lose by telling you the truth. The second strategy is seek out someone who's already where you want to be in life. This is so important. Seek out someone who is already where you want to be in life. Find somebody who's already where you want to be in your marriage. Find somebody who's already where you want to be in your career. Find somebody who's already where you want to be in your financial planning. Find somebody who's already where you want to be in your spiritual life. Whatever the case may be, find that kind of life coach person, right? Seek out people who, in a sense, already have a map for you, right? They've already got the GPS. Regularly ask them. How did you get here? How'd you get here from there? How did you get this far? Find those who have an ability to say, well, listen, I just went that away. 
And if you go that way too, I think you'll find some good spots on the journey too. That's not the whole answer, but it certainly will put you on the right path. I want to be where you are. Please give me some direction. How did you get there? What, what were some pitfalls you found? What were some bad turns you made that I should look for and try to avoid? See? Now, we often make the same mistake Rehoboam made. We often ask people who really are no further along on the journey than we are. And so it goes down like this. You know, we have a fight with our wife one day, and the next day at work, some guy walks by our cubicle at work, a buddy of ours, and he says, uh, how you doing? And we say, oh, man, not too good. Here's what went down. Here's what I said. Here's what my wife said. And we ask him, what would you do? And he says, well, here's what I'd do. I'd tell her I wear the pants in this here family, and I'm the man of this here house, and you better darn well do what I say. And if you don't like it, you can get out. That's what I'd tell her to do. And we say, huh, okay. Well, if that's what Billy Bob thinks I should do, that's what I'll go do too. And then we go do that, and our wife leaves us <laughs> and asks for a divorce. And then we go tell Billy Bob about it, and he says, oh, yep, that's what my wife did too. <laughs> and we need to be wise. Don't count on advice from people who aren't any further along on the journey than we are. Chances are the bad advice you've gotten in the past, even maybe from professional counselors, from pastors, from teachers, from coaches, was from people that who were no closer to being where you wanted to be than you were already yourself. That's what Rehoboam did, right? Now, he went to the right guys first. They're the ones who had the right context for his decision. They're the ones that had the experience. They're the ones that had the wisdom. They're the ones that had the character. They're the ones that had the temperament. They had his best interests at heart. They had the best interests of the kingdom at heart. And then he went to his friends who were no further along than he was, and that's where he blew it. Now, here's a third principle. If possible, ask more than one person. And so Solomon tells us this in Proverbs eleven fourteen, Where there is no guidance, the people fall. But in abundance of counselors, there's victory. So think about it. If you ask three different people and you get three different answers, you're not any further ahead, are you? But if you ask 10 people or 15 people or 20 people and 10 people or 14 of those people or are 17 of those people, they give you the same answer, chances are that's the right answer. That's the right direction, right? You should probably the follow the majority that said this is the right answer. They went that away. And so then the fourth principle is this. Talk to someone you know, and when you can, I mean, obviously you can't always do this. It's, it's crunch time, but if you can, you got time, talk to someone you know and to someone you don't know. This is so important to get some objectivity to get some perspective on your decision. Even the most wise, even the best intentioned friend or family member in the world is still just a little too close to the situation to be fully objective. And so you want to talk to someone you know and you want to talk to someone you don't know, right? Your close family member, your close, close friend, their opinion matters. It's important. They love you. They want what's best for you. But you need to balance out your advice with someone who can be completely objective, along with the advice of someone who 100% loves you, because they might love you too much, right? They want to do what's best for you, but that doesn't mean they necessarily know what is best for you, because they're just too close to the situation sometimes. They may be too close to the people you're having a problem with. So find somebody who doesn't know any of the people you're dealing with and whatever big decision situation you've got. Find somebody who can give you clear, objective wisdom. That's the fourth. And the fifth, the final principle is this. Be sensitive to the fact that God might actually speak to you through this person. God might actually speak to you through this person. That doesn't mean you front-end load it with, hey, don't forget, I'm meeting with these people tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., so I'm trusting God to speak through you to me right now, so make sure your advice is perfect, okay? Go. No pressure, right? That's not how you do it. That's not how you go about it. But when you're seeking advice, you go into it praying, Lord, please help me to hear from you through the advice of this person. Now, here's the amazing thing. Here's the amazing thing. This is what blows me away when I think about this. God so often answers that prayer. 
And that person might tell you a story that's completely different from your situation. However, there is something in their story that illustrates the very principle you're looking for. And by them finding the right solution to a similar decision that they made in the past, that helps you solve your dilemma. It's amazing when that happens. Now, here's the other amazing thing that happens. This always blows me away, too. But this is amazing. This is God, too, right? Sometimes the advice of this person stinks to high heaven. It's the worst advice. You've, it's the stupidest thing you've ever heard in your life. And the minute they open their mouth and speak, you're thinking, what? That's not right. No, no way. That's so dumb. I can't believe this person just told me that, right? But their answer, let's call it answer A. Answer A is so absurd that it might help you make the decision that, oh, well, obviously it's answer B, right? Or it's answer C or it's answer D. Suddenly it hits you. Oh, well, yeah, I'm definitely not going to do that. So this must be what I'm supposed to do. The opposite of what they said, that must be what I'm supposed to do. So listen, don't miss this. If you went in praying for God to speak to you through that person, what happened? God still spoke to you through that person, even if they told you the wrong thing. And so be sensitive to that fact that whether they give you good advice or bad advice, God might actually be speaking to you through their words and guiding you to the right answer for you. That's the GPS. That's God's positional system at work. Now, when you feel like you found the right person to seek advice from, we had those five principles, right? Here's what we do. We found the right people. Okay, I got my right people. Now, here's what I need to ask them. There's three questions I need to ask them. First one's this. Are there any other options I'm considering or any of the options I'm considering that are outside the boundaries of Scripture as far as you know, that's your first big thing. Is any I've told you my three options. Are any of those options just way outside of the providential will of God or way outside of the moral will of God? You've studied the Bible more than I have. You've been a Christian longer than I have. You've heard more sermons. You've read more Bible studies. You've done all these things more than me. So is there anything that I just told you that you're aware of out of these options that I'm considering? Are any of those outside of the providential or moral will of God? Because if there are, man, that's awesome. Because obviously you can cross that one off your list right away. That can quickly narrow down your choices because you know that whatever the right answer is, whatever God's personal will for your life is in that situation, it has to fall between those two guardrails, those two boundaries. So help me, is there anything I'm considering that's outside of those guardrails as far as you know? That's the first question you want to ask. Second question is, what do you think is the wise thing for me to do. I've laid out all my options. Here's A, B, C, D. We're not thinking about right or wrong. We're thinking about wise, right? What's the wise thing for me to do? What if, what if none of these issues, none of these options that I've laid out, what if none of them are necessarily wrong? What if none of them are necessarily obviously right? right? Maybe it's not a moral issue. It's just what's the right decision? What's the wrong decision? Let's not think that way. What's the wise thing? In your opinion, from your experience, what do you think is the wise thing for me to do? That's your second question. Here's the third question. What would you do if you were me? I'll give you an example of that. I have a friend who is a doctor literally the smartest person I've ever met in my life. Just a brilliant, 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 brilliant guy. Especially when it came to medical situations. If I had to make a medical decision, do I do this or not do this? I would ask him, what would you do if you were me? And I trusted his answer. And I do that a lot with other doctors. If I'm in a doctor situation and they say, well, you could do this or you could do that, and I say, well, what would you do if you were me, right? How would you make the decision? If you were in my situation, based on your experience, if you were in my situation with my resources, my uh, bonuses, my pluses, my minuses, what would you do? What would you do? And make sure you ask clear and strategic questions, and you're going to be amazed you are going to be amazed at how many times God will use the body of Christ to give you the right answers. This is uh, not a less spiritual approach to pr than prayer. This is not instead of prayer. This is 100% in addition to prayer. And this is often how God will answer your prayer. 
You might be really fortunate. You might get that audible voice of God in a lightning bolt. Awesome for you. Uh, That's fantastic. I wish I was you. I've never had that. It's never happened to me yet. So this is a scriptural approach to finding wisdom through godly people that God has placed around you. Now, as we wrap things up tonight, there are also, real quickly, three reasons you won't do this, (laughs) even though you know you should. So let's talk about those three reasons. Here's the first reason you might choose not to do this. Number one, ignorance. And I don't mean that offensively. I don't mean like you're ignorant. You know, I don't mean that. I mean, here's what I mean what happens. I don't know who to ask. So I guess maybe I'll just guess. Hopefully I'll get it right. Maybe. Maybe. But maybe you'll crash into several cars along the way and then slam into a guardrail, right? Maybe. So here's what Solomon says about that plan. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. But he who walks wisely will be delivered. So don't just trust your guessing ability. Don't just trust your luck. That's foolish, Solomon says. That's ignorant. Don't do that. Go find somebody. Somebody. Ask someone. Remember, God speaks through wrong people sometimes, too. Ask Balaam. Even donkeys sometimes have some advice for you, right? So find someone, right? Well, I don't know who to ask. Well, look a little harder. Here's the second reason we won't do this. Pride pride. Like my example of driving through Raleigh for hours and hours, right, before we stopped and asked directions. We think, well, I should be able to figure this out on my own. I don't need to talk to anybody else. I'm savvy. I'm smart. I can figure this out. It's a sign of weakness to stop and ask somebody else for advice or directions. I'll figure this out. I'll keep driving around long enough. Eventually, I'll see something that looks familiar. I'll see a road sign. I'll get a pretty good sense of direction. I'll, I'll figure this out. I'm smart. I'm savvy. Again, Solomon, wisest man ever, said it's vital to leverage the wisdom and the experience of other people before you charge ahead. He says this in Proverbs 13.10, with pride comes only contention, but wisdom is with the well advised. That's so important for us. Here's the third and final reason we maybe won't do this, and it's rebellion. And we're all guilty of this one, too. This one says, you know what, I already know what I'm going to hear. I already know what God's going to tell me. I don't want to hear it. I I don't want to know. I I already know what the right answer is. I already know what I'm supposed to do. I already know what I should do, but I don't want to do it. So I'm not going to ask anybody else about it, and then I don't have to hear it, right? And when you find yourself avoiding counsel in a situation because you want to avoid hearing what you already know, You need to make that a giant red flag, and that flag should read, hello, somebody, right? Proverbs 12, 15 says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. So we need to listen to counsel. We need to look for people to help us along the way. So to recap really quickly, the providential will of God and the moral will of God, God's given us these two boundaries, his personal will for your life has to be somewhere between those two guardrails. And one of the best ways to find it out, if you have to find it out really quickly, if it's like, I need to know in five minutes what I'm supposed to do, right? The best way to do that is find somebody who's already further ahead of you on the journey. Find somebody who's been that way, who's made that kind of a decision. Ask them the questions that God has put in your path. Who can give me the right directions? And then do what their wisdom tells you to do. Let's pray as Joel comes. Father God, I thank you that you have not made discovering your will impossible for us. You really haven't even made your discovering of your will even all that difficult for us, as some of us believe sometimes. You actually want us to discover your will even more than we ourselves want to know it. And you've given us so many tools. You've given us your written word. You've given us your Holy Spirit to help us understand your written word. You've given us access to you through Jesus' name, through Jesus' sacrifice. We can talk directly with you, our Heavenly Father. You've given us Christian examples all around us, all the way through history, but even right next to us in this present time. And so, God, please help us bring to mind the people in our life that we need to learn from, the people we need to listen to, 
all along the way in our life. There are people that you've placed around us who have wisdom to share. And that's what the body of Christ is all about. It's about reaching out to each other. It's about supporting each other. It's about building each other up. It's about caring for each other. It's about looking out for each other. God, please help us realize that today. Help us avoid the ignorance, the pride, and the rebellion that often come into play that keep us from asking the right questions of the right people when we're struggling for a really serious answer. Lord, for every person here today or watching online, for every person who's struggling with some big decision in their life, I pray that even now you would begin to impress upon their heart, you know what, here's a person you should go talk to about that. Here's a person you should go talk to. I pray that you would direct them to the right person, to a wiser, perhaps older Christian who's further along the journey than they are, someone who has already accomplished what they're trying to accomplish. And I pray that in some conversation this week, they would hear somebody say something that, man, it just clicks and it makes them go, oh, hey, you know what? That's a person I need to keep in mind. That's a person I need to ask about decisions I'm trying to make in the future. God, I pray that you would make those road signs clear, that you would help each of us find the people who can give us correct directions, good wisdom, even better yet, one that could say, you know what, I know the way, I'm going there anyway, follow me. That's what Jesus did. Here's the way I'm going, follow me. We need those people in our life, Lord, and I pray that you would lead us to them. Even if we are not struggling with a big decision now, help us even now begin to make a list Who am I going to go to if I have a financial question? Who am I going to go to if I have a marriage question? Who am I going to go to if I have a career question? Help us figure out who those people are now, Lord, so that if the time comes where we've got to make a quick, rapid decision and we don't have a lot of time, we can just call somebody up and say, hey, here's what I'm dealing with. What do you think the wise thing to do is? What, do you, what would you do in my situation? Is there anything that I've listed, my options that I'm considering? Is there anything that you can say right off the bat, cross that one off, that's outside of either the providential or moral will of God? Help us make a list of those people, Father. That's my prayer for all of us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Give life, you are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. In our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise at your breath. In our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only.
we pour out our praise at your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only great will cry, these bones will sing, great are you, Lord. All the earth will shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing, great In our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise at your breath. In our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. so good, Lord God, and we thank you that you will not lead us astray. We ask for your wisdom. Bring the right people around us. Bring the right counsel when we are in, especially when we are in times of great need. We love you. We lean on you. We worship you tonight. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless, guys. Aloha.